so so it's my thank you okay so uh it's my pleasure to introduce Mihail Ifrim from uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison, speaking about low regularity solutions for nonlinear waves. Thank you so much for the invitation. I would like first to say that um, uh, this talk is going to have a lot of things and it's long and but please stop me at any at any time if you have questions. So this extends some results that I previously um, obtained with Daniel uh, and then later on with uh, uh, Alberta as well. And I will begin with a story. So this, this go eventually this is related to water waves though the title related meaning that some ideas are coming from water waves. And the title of my talk is Low Regularity Solution for Nonlinear Waves. So let me explain um, the main, uh, um, the main gist, let's see if I can make this work. How do I make this work? Um, how do I pass to the next? Okay, I, I got it. Okay, so um, I'll begin with a bit of a story that is meant to set up the stage for the results that I'm gonna talk. And the equations that I'm gonna talk about are two quasi-linear equations. One of them is called the nonlinear wave equation. As you can see here, the metric depends on the unknown u. And I'm going to talk about as well um, about the derivative nonlinear wave equation, where the metric here depends on the derivative of u. Those are two classes of equations that are the objects of our study today. And I will um, compare them a little bit just to avoid confusions. But at the end of the day, some of the results are going to apply to one of them and some to the other one. Now, relatively speaking, they're related. And I'm going to point this out uh, in a bit. So we are looking at this, uh, those two equations, and um, the way they're related is if you differentiate the derivative nonlinear wave equation, it's going to turn into a nonlinear wave equation. Now the unknown is going to be different. It's going to be your new unknown is going to be the derivative of u, and you're going to treat it like a new u. Nevertheless, if you're going to take the derivative of the derivative nonlinear wave equation, you're going to end up with nonlinear wave equation. Maybe I'm going to say things that are very trivial, but it's good to um, just point out uh, the differences and then... Um, uh, sorry, in the first one, u is scalar or is vector value? Okay, good point, good point. You, I put it here, I simplified it for the... It can be a system as well. The only difference that I want to emphasize here, so it works, I oversimplified putting it as a scalar, but it can be a system as long as you make sure that the metric is the same for all the equations in your system. In other words, that you have a single speed. We also call this... Uh, diagonal uh, equations, meaning that not the whole equation, but the principal part of this system, if you look at it as a system, should have the same metric uh, used in every equation of the system. But I just simplified it here. So it can be systems and this works as well for systems. As you can see, I simplified it as well. I did not put the right hand side, even though I could have put a flux, you know, a, a, an extra bit here in our function that could have depend on the u and the derivative of u as well on both sides. So um, uh, the two equations that I'm gonna I'm gonna talk today, and uh, so this is the first term that I was saying that I could add. And here is the notation for the Cauchy data, which is the trivial notation for a wave equation. You need to know the initial position and the initial velocity. So those are the two equations, like. Uh, Ovidio was asking is this remains true if there are systems, if there are scalars, as long as you have the same metric that works for all the bits that are considered your principal part of the, of the equation. And that's hard to determine what's the principal part, but it's doable. Now, going further, when you have such equations or systems, uh, you're going to look at local world poseness in general. That's one first question that you would ask. And, uh, and this you'll answer in the Hadamard style. Here I said enhanced uh, Hadamard uh, definition of local world poseness because it's different. It contains uh, other bits that usually you don't see in Hadamard definition. Nevertheless, it's Hadamard in a nutshell. So we are looking at the system and uh, we worry about the existence of the solutions first in this class of, of uh, functions, which is continuous from this time interval zero t with values in this HS space, which is a Sobolev space, which I defined above. And I called it H round zero s, this H calligraphic s, it's 
stays for ages cross ages minus one, whereas denotes the regularity. So this is where we start with our, our initial data and we want to prove that we have existence of the solution in this class. We also hope that we have uniqueness in the same class of um, functions as the one above. We do have, we want to prove continuous dependence on solutions in terms of the solution map that goes from the initial um, data to the solution. And, uh, and here I should uh, mention that this is, um, I should say that earlier that this time interval actually depends on the lifespan of the solution uh, and depends on the size of your initial data. So you're, you start with some initial data of size epsilon and you want to say, look, my time of dependence of the existence of the solution depends on this size. And finally, uh, this is the extra bit that you usually don't see in the Hadamard definition of all poseness. You do see the first three. Um, is this weak Lipschitz dependence on the, on the initial data, basically? Because um, uh, you do have only continuous dependence in strong topology, which the strong topology is ages, because this is a quasi-linear equation. You don't hope, hope to have Lipschitz. That will be true for semi-linear problems. So this is another characterization of you know, semi-linear versus quasi-linear. Nevertheless, the weak Lipschitz comes um, as a dependence in a, in a stronger, like in a weaker, sorry, topology. This S0, it's further away from this, the original S in which you prove well poseness. So for the purpose of today's talk, imagine that this is zero, it's somewhere uh, around one, around the value one. And um, so it's something quite far away from the exponent that gives you the local world poseness. So this is about the local world poseness in the Hadamard sense. And this is one question you can ask. Now, another question that is related to answering this question, because this is what we we'll want to answer today. And we want to answer it in the low regularity setting, meaning going as low as you can with this S that you see in here. And there are some limitations, which I'm gonna talk uh, a bit in a second. And there are some related questions that I would want to, to emphasize, even though there are not local world poseness questions, is this, um, question of long time behavior. The reason I'm saying this is because some of the questions that you ask within this long time behavior type of question, there are things that we worked on for other problems, but it turns out they're essential tools for you to later use in terms of getting low regularity local world poseness results. So here, one question that uh, is under this long time behavior uh, banner basically is the extended lifespan of solutions for small data and this is one interesting question that um, connects with what i'm going to say today and uh, it will give uh, i will give you some understanding in in the next slide or so so um, let me uh, explain a little bit so if we look at our uh, problems, we, I wrote them here, both of them. Um, basically, I wrote the scaling symmetries. In terms of respond, you know, in, in terms of low regularity well poseness, you are looking at local well poseness in some Sobolev spaces HS. And the question is, what is going to be this S? What is the smallest S you can go for? And the, the question here has, has some um, some metrics that you you need to take into account. So first example, one, one issue, you cannot really hope for any S. One S that is going to be some guidance S for you is going to be the one given by the symmetries of the problem. Meaning first you look at the scaling. Scaling gives you this. So the scaling symmetry is this uh, that I have written here. This is the one for nonlinear wave equation. This is how the solution scales. And for the derivative nonlinear wave equation, this is the uh, law, the scaling law that the solution preserves and the equation itself preserves. Now, once you use the scaling and ask yourself, what is the um, homogeneous Sobole space that is gonna be conserving this uh, scaled solution, you realize that for the nonlinear wave equation, your scaling, your critical scaling exponent is going to be dimension over two. And for the derivative nonlinear wave equation, is going to be dimension over two plus one. This is your limitation. This is how low you hope to get with your regularity. But this is a quasi, all those, you know, both of those problems are nonlinear, quasi, you know, are quasi linear wave equations. 
So to really reach the scaling in any case for quasi-linear problems is it's, it's close to impossible if it's really a quasi-linear question. It's true for semi-linear problems, but not for quasi-linear ones. So this is the guidance. This is how low you want to get, but the question is, can you? And what is known, you're going to see in a bit. So this is the open question, how, uh, how far we can get close to, you know, how close basically we can get to this critical exponent. So um, is this the optimal one? Can we really reach it? So maybe to put things uh, in context, it's better to start with uh, with the story early on, meaning in the 70s. So if you go back into the into 70s, you see this theorem of Hughes, Cato, and Marsden in 76, when they prove that, look, we can get local world poseness for a nonlinear wave equation, as long as you are sure that the regularity is above uh, it's one above the scaling. And the way they proved this was using something that no is now is very well known, it's energy estimates. So, um, and this originates to the work of Kata and people that lived around that time. So basically, what do you do? What is this, what is at the heart of proving this theorem? So you do some energy estimates um, and you start with some Sobolev regularity, let's call it sigma. And the sigma is pretty much arbitrary basically. But um, you can think for the purpose of this talk as being positive, sigma greater or equal than one. Okay, let's, let's make this uh, sigma greater or equal to one. So I start with this regularity. See, and around the 70s, there was no issue on the regularity. Basically, people did not want to improve lower than, uh, than this one. This can be improved. So uh, you get an energy estimate of this type if you do the energy estimates and you don't really uh, care too much. And then you, you're going to pull out this derivative of your unknown in L infinity. So, and you have energy estimates, and I said the sigma, it's arbitrary, anything you want, this is the regularity that you would want to work with. And this energy is going to be equivalent with the Sobolev norm in this H sigma space of your solution. Now, this is, you know, this is a quasi-linear problem. So this energy doesn't necessarily need to be, it's not really, because it's a quasi-linear problem. So this is not going to be your energy linear energy associated to your problem is going to be some energy that you're going to work a little bit to to come up with because your problem is quasi-linear like I said but nevertheless once you find this energy you will be able to prove an energy estimates of this sorts but for this energy estimates to really work and close things up you will need this norm here that I'm uh, underlining this L infinity norm of the gradient of u to stay finite and, and this actually is one of the requirements that they actually ended up asking. We call this a control norm. So you need to control this, this norm. And as long as you control this norm, you can rewrite this energy estimate as a Grunewald type estimate, which you see in here. And this is going to hold as long as you do have control of this exponential. Not the, actually the exponent of the exponential needs to be that something that you need to, to put your hands on. And if you do control this, then you are in good shape. Then you do have solutions. And that's basically what they did. They got control of this gradient of u in L infinity by using Sobolev embedding. And when you use Sobolev embedding, you lose in terms of regularity because this is gonna force you to place your solution in just in some AJS space and some Sobolev space where S is gonna be greater than S critical plus one. So you cannot really be fancy here if you straightforward use Sobolev, but nevertheless, this basically solves the problem if this is what you are after, just solving it and not really caring about the regularity. Now, you do have a continuation criteria type of a result, meaning that you can say, look, solutions can be continued as long as I know that my gradient of U is in L1, L infinity. And as long as this is finite, then I'm fine. Then I can continue my solution. So this is what the story was. And don't remember, I'm referring to this L infinity norm as a control norm. So now, going back to the wave equations that we looked at, they're wave equations. So they're basically dispersive equation. So you have at your disposal three cards estimates. And people ask themselves, OK, can you use those three cards estimates in the, your local world poseness theory? And the answer to this is yes, we do have three cards estimates. This is the three cards estimates for dimension greater or equal than three where you get that your gradient of u basically it's L2 in time, L infinity in space. 
in dimension two, you don't have L2, you have less, you have L4 and L infinity. But as you can see here, you manage to bound those guys using street cards with those uh, initial values that are in, in, in those, uh, those sub-level spaces that you see in here. So if I knew street cards estimates, if, uh, um, if they knew street cards estimates back in the day, they could eff efficiently lower this regularity as you can see here, so inst instead of having a one, they lower it to one half if you're going to use it. Remember, this was by using this, you're just going to have the criticality, which is n over two plus one. This was direct use of Sobolev. If you use um, street cards, you're going to lower it. So instead of as critical, you're going to remain with as critical, but instead of plus one, you're going to have plus one half. So instantaneously, you know, in a moment, I don't know, I'm speaking Romanian lately, so I'm forgetting English. Um, so in a moment, you are, um, you are improving your results. You are getting one half down. So you are one half closer to the, to the criticality. And the same thing happens. You are halving your distance to the criticality exponent in the dimension equals to as well because of the use of the strict arts estimates. Now, um, the difficulty with this approach, the one, it's too good to be true, and it's true, it's too good. The difficulty with this is that using strict arts estimates is you don't really have it at your disposal always. And in this case, it's really depending on the metric, on the regularity of the metric that you are using. So the gradient of the metric, it uh, has to be L2, L infinity. This is the regularity that one needs to have in order for us to really apply the strict arts estimates that, uh, that we have at our, our disposal. And um, so if you go with the uh, regularity of the metric lower, then there are some discussions which I'm going to explain. So you don't really can pull out of your hat uh, street cards estimates and directly apply it. And that's going to be the case in, in our problem as, uh, as well. So there is a long story here. Initially, street cards estimates were proved for um, um, constant coefficients, and then for smooth metrics, this is work of Limblad, Soggs, and Kapitansky. So as long as your wave equation has the metric smooth, then you're fine. Then uh, for C2 a metric, it was proved by Smith in dimension two and three. And uh, for two derivatives of the metric in L1 and infinity, Tataru proved that you do have three cards for all dimensions. And this is somewhere around the 90s. Um, so, but the problem is that you, this is not uh, good enough for us because we do not have L1, L infinity. For our problem, our metric is basically for us, the metric is the gradient. We only know that the gradient of U is in L2, L, uh, gradient of G is in L, U, L infinity. So we do not have any of such results, any of street cards estimates holding for this, for this metric. Though, unfortunately, um, uh, so this is the one issue, but however, uh, there are some counterexamples actually showing, look, you don't have street arts estimates, sharp street arts estimates as the one that I'm going to highlight now, like those one too, but you do have some street arts estimates um, that are going to be applicable, we call them street arts estimate with losses, so nothing, you know, there is still some work that can be done and you still have some gain that you can you can uh, use even though your uh, metric is not this regular. And like I said, it's proven to be sharp. The fact that this is how much you need in terms of the regularity of the metric for you to actually use those three cards estimates out of the box. Uh, and those counterexamples are due to Smith and, and Tataru. Now, going further on this page, I want us to tell the story a little bit further. So even if, uh, our metric doesn't have the right regularity and it's below the two derivatives threshold uh, where you can apply strict arts estimates. We can do apply, like I said, strict arts estimates with loss. And you wanna think this at this problem paradifferentially. So let me, in a paradifferential formula, meaning that I'm gonna truncate my unknown at frequency lambda. So this is your unknown u. This is the wave equation in a paradifferential form. We localize it at frequency lambda. And this is the portion of the solution that lives at this frequency. And then where this is a dyadic frequency, let me be clear. And this frequency lambda is a parameter. And then you truncate the coefficients at frequency lambda to the, to the gamma. 
And this for if you've referred it, so maybe you are familiar with only using lambda without the power gamma, meaning that gamma is one. This is actually the paradifferential calculus. But historically, this, this did not stay as being gamma. This, this gamma moved around and it was something in between um, one half and one, meaning that, uh, so this goes under the name of semi-classical um, time scale. So for each frequency, lambda, you can look at this equation and think, okay, well, perhaps I do not have Strickart's estimates all the way to time one, but perhaps I can prove that on a slighter time uh, interval, shorter time interval, there is something that we call the semi-classical time scale. And this is exactly this lambda to the gamma. And on this small interval, I do have Strickart's estimates that are without loss. And then I'm gonna take all of those three cards estimate on all of those pieces, time interval pieces that I got, and then I'm gonna add them all up. And when I'm adding them up, I'm gonna get a three cards estimate on the whole unit time interval. And how do I add them up? I add them using holder inequalities, the trivial ones. But then obviously when I'm gonna add those pieces, I'm gonna have some loss. That's okay because that's the best you can do. Now, there is a lot of work um, that has been done in terms of how do you really split this time interval. People have done it equal, you know, time interval equal pieces. Others done it with not equal pieces. Some pieces that actually accounted for um, where basically why you don't want to, let me explain a bit, why you don't really want those time intervals to be equal because you don't really know the L1 norm of the metric where it's concentrated on, on which portion. So you actually want to do the splitting based on, on how the cell one norm of, of the metric is gonna, is gonna be, uh, how you said, um, distribute. So, and, and this is actually, there are multiple iteration of the, this, this un understanding of how you do the splitting of the time interval. This is history, this is work. There are two lines of, uh, of research independently developed by Bauri and Shaman, and then refined and uh, proved finally by Tataru in 1899 uh, to 99. And those are some papers, many of them. I got the short version. Uh, I asked directly <laughs> what were the results. Okay, so those are, there is a whole story how you get three cards with losses. The reason I'm saying is that, okay, there are with losses. And you may ask, why would I want that? And you would want that because it's a trade-off at the end of the day that you're going to see. So, um, let me go further and explain uh, to you the next slide. So to put things in the context. So this, this is the, uh, so far what you've seen, there is a step of uh, a piece of the history in which we had those three cards estimates at our disposal. The next step was the result of Tataru and, uh, and Smith, which says, look, which happened uh, 20 years or 30 years ago, 20, which says that we have local world postness for this nonlinear wave equation, as long as you and uh, your S is greater than S critical plus one half in dimension N greater than or equal than three. Uh, and this regularity is S greater or equal than S critical plus three over four if you're in dimension N equals two. And um, so you already see that uh, this was an improvement previous to the 70s result of the Hughes, Cato, and Marsden because of this one half, because of the strict application of the three cards. But, um, and this, um, let me say what, let me be, okay. So how this uh, got proved, classical three cards estimates. And when you do three cards, when you do class energy estimates, you realize there are some weird terms. And you, if you use, Loss, uh, lossless three cards estimates, the one that I told you about, you do almost nearly lossless three cards estimate, you do get this regularity. However, there was an intermediate step that uh, it was essential, and it was not enough just to use this semi classical scales type, you know, those constructions of three cards estimate to get this low regularity result. It, it, there was an intermediate step, which basically the idea came up in the work of Kleiderman and Rodiansky that worked for the worked on the wave equation as well, but work on uh, Einstein's equations as well. And this is some idea in, that says the following: Look, your metric G also satisfies a wave equation, and if you take that into account. And there are many steps toward, you know, towards the final answer, but that in itself is the idea. And that wave equation for the metric allows you 
to actually uh, manipulate things and get this low regularity result. So this was some idea of Kleiderman and Rodiansky. They did not use it to finalize the result. And then, but Tataru realized and used it for his, um, his uh, work in, uh, for the nonlinear wave equation, though Kleiderman and Rodiansky were the first to prove a similar result for Einstein's equation. A similar result meaning a low regularity result for this uh, Einstein's equations using this wave equation idea. Now you ask, why is this actually so critical? Why is this, um, uh, how do you know you cannot lower this? Okay, and the result is sharp. And the reason you know you cannot lower it is because you have this, um, you have some enemies. So it, there is a construction and Limblad gave it in three plus one dimensions, which are some wave packets basically. So let me explain a little bit. Imagine that, um, I don't know how much time I should spend on this. So imagine I have my characteristic surface and imagine that the time is going upward and I have some solutions that are very localized, think of some bump functions. Now I'm gonna write like some tubes. I'm not gonna write them straight like slabs because they're, they're gonna match the geometry of the surface. So imagine that I have those very localized solution and Limblad says, look, if I'm gonna look at this solution and let it interact it with itself, so I'm gonna have another tube interacting, basically those are the enemies that are gonna be the ones, those are called wave packets. And those are gonna be the ones that are gonna tell me, look, uh, these objects are gonna make my strict arts estimate sharp. And I can construct, Limblad did it for three dimensions, three space dimension, the same construction he did works in all dimensions. And you can really say that once this interaction is allowed, then that's it, that's, that proves the sharpness in a nutshell. So what, what are we after now? Why, why is this interesting if this is sharp? Okay, um, the reason we are interested in this is the following. So we realized that this result of, of um, uh, Smith and Tataru in 2001 is sharp result for a generic wave equation because naively the self-interacting wave packets are happening, yeah? Now, what do we do from here is exactly this slide. So this slide says, okay, we'll ask what happens? Can you say anything if we remove those self-interacting wave packets uh, from the problem. And this led us to the following example that I'm gonna uh, show it to you. So we are looking at the wave equation, a quasi-linear wave equation that satisfies this null, non-linear null condition. Now, let me emphasize non-linear null condition. It's not the regular null condition. So we look at the quasi-linear wave equation. It's not that generic as it was in Tataru and Smith because we ask this equation to satisfy this non-linear null condition, which basically is the condition that says those uh, self-interacting packets that were the enemy are not there anymore. This is what this says. Now, for um, so this kills the self-interaction wave packets along the null geodesic. So for those of you who don't know, if we're not familiar with uh, null conditions, let me say that this nonlinear wave uh, null condition is not the same with the classical null condition that appears in the work of Kleiderman and Christodoulou and so on. This is a null condition, the, the null condition, the original one, is for the linearization of a wave equation around the zero solution. Um, and that applies uh, in general for, for all the problems you've seen so far. What we call a nonlinear null condition is the linearization of the wave equation um, around an arbitrary solution. So it's different. Um, so um, once you have this condition imposed, the question that was open for a long time was, okay, and this was a conjecture made by Tataru at ICM in 2002, was, okay, can you lower the regularity uh, that Tataru and Smith got in their result if you assume this extra nonlinear null condition is satisfied? And the answer to this, like I said, was open for a long time. There were some partial results I'm gonna say in a bit. And, um, and now we can prove, yes, we can actually answer that yes, it can be improved 
we don't really answer and there is room for improvement though and i can tell you where is room for improvement so it's not fully resolved we do have a partial result saying yes if this happens we can go and lower if this no nonlinear null condition happens we can lower those guys one half gets lowered here and in two dimension three fourths get lower actually they're halved so it's you're gonna see you know in a you know in a second how we do that so together with uh, with Daniel and Albert, we had to choose a good model problem to really show this conjecture. So one particular nonlinear, you know, quasi-linear wave equation that satisfied uh, the null condition is what we called um, the minimal surface. And to explain a little bit about this minimal surface. Um, so we choose an equation was so ours was the time like minimal surface equation, which is a nonlinear wave equation which described uh, describes the critical points of the functional of the area functional for a time like submanifold sigma. So this is a geometric equation, and the reason we like geometric equation is because they have a good structure, and you'll see that's the case here as well. So if you think about this geometric equation. Um, um, you could think of it as, uh, um, so you can think about locally as a surface and as a graph as being the graph of a function. And u is being the defining function as a graph for this surface. And then you can write the Euler's Lagrange equations that you've seen here, which honestly, they don't look very good. They're very complicated. This should remind you of what it's called the elliptic minimal surface equation, though in the elliptical minimal surface equations, you have pluses here. Uh, of course, this equation, I, I would, we did not work with it the way you see it here, but though we, we do, we rewrote it with re-expressing using Minkowski metric, but restricted on the, on the surface. And this is the, the metric that you see in here. And the way we rewrote it is in this um, uh, covariant form. And this is our covariant wave equation which you can check in a second, that is the case, that once you can pass from this ugly looking guy to this uh, covariant form of the wave equation. Remember, this is the metric. So it's Minkowski plus uh, um, something. And uh, about this equation, it turns out that we call it minimal surface, though it comes in many variations depending on the field. And you can see here born in field in electromagnetics and so on, I'm not gonna spend time. So there are many names attached to this equation, we call it a minimal surface. Now, this is our model problem. And let me say what our result is. We basically said, look, for this time like minimal surface equation, so not the generic wave equation that the Tyler and Smith had, the one, this model problem that satisfies this um, nonlinear null condition, we can actually prove local world closeness in this HS where we managed to lower the regularity to one fourth in three dimensions and higher and through three fourths or three eighths in dimension n equals two. So this is a huge improvement. We actually reduced to one fourth. We got closer to the criticality uh, with one fourth, um, uh, much closer than, than now. This is not, you can ask me, is this sharp? The answer is no, it's not. You can lower a little bit more. And we know how to do that, but another question to ask is that new method that I'm talking gonna help you go lower it even more. Um, and this is sharp, the answer is you need a counterexample to be sure, so we don't have that either. So this is first result proving that um, the null condition uh, local world poseness conjecture. So this is a big deal was for a long time open. Improves, like I said, with one fourth and with three eighths in depending on the dimension, the work of Smith and Tataru. And I also want to mention that a, a similar work in this vein, so pre our result, was this epsilon removal result of Kleiderman, Rodiansky, and Zeftel, meaning that they actually showed here by epsilon, I mean they showed equality for their problem. So they have, instead of saying s greater than s critical plus one fourth, they actually said they prove it that happens at that regularity. That's what I call an epsilon removal. And this was also true by Ettinger, which in his state, this was a former student of Daniel, actually proved this for the same equation that I'm talking about, this result that, um, that we have. Ettinger proved the same removal epsilon result, but Claudia, uh, Kleiderman, Rodiansky, and Zeftel proved it for Einstein's equations. Uh, so in GR, Ettinger proved it for this minimal surface. We, uh, no, sorry, 
they need. I take it back. This is one half. This is what they did. Um, so this is the epsilon removal. So this is how far Ettinger got for the minimal surface. Sorry. And um, and for the same kind of regularity, Kleiderman and Rodiansky have, have it for Einstein's equations. Now, so as you can see, there was an epsilon removal. You got closer to the one half. Here, it's much better. It's one fourth and three eighths, sorry. I got carried out by the epsilon removal thing. So this is what it has known. Now, let me point out in a nutshell what are here. It's probably the most important bit of the, the talk now that you have the history. Now it comes down to how did we do it? So the way we did it, and I made these drawings here, the way you've seen it uh, done by uh, Tataru and Smith was classical energy estimates and lossless three cards estimates. And this went down to the criticality, which we said, okay, is this what we called S, uh, the Sobolev exponent, uh, Smith and Tataru, which this, if you remember, this was S critical plus one half. And this, let's say with dimension D equals to three. I don't, yeah. And the same is true, but with the corresponding exponent in dimension two. And now what is the idea? This was what was known. Now, what is the, the idea now? Now is the following. We do the following. We loss, we give up on the lossless three cards estimates. We give them up, meaning that we don't want them sharp. We are gonna want them with losses. And we assure you that with those losses, we're actually going to gain much more. We lose here a bit, but we get a bunch here. We win a bunch here, meaning that we're going to introduce a new way of doing cubic balanced energy. I'm going to, we're doing energy estimates. We call them cubic balanced energy estimates. So we lose a little bit in street cards, but we do something with the energy estimates, which we did not find as possible until our work in waterways. We uh, give up on something we win on this other side and this leads to a very low uh crit, you know exponent regularity exponent this is if this was let's say in dimension d equals to t if this was s critical plus one fourth plus one squared here you get s critical plus one fourth so the gain it's it's amazing and let me so this story this this tell, tells you two things that i need to tell you what is cubic balanced energy estimates what does it mean so let me get with the story from the beginning. Maybe you are familiar. And this is where this long time existence problem, the type of tools we use then helped in this, in this picture. So let me, let me be clear. So I'm gonna, for a moment, forget about everything I said, just remember the results. And think about if you have an equation that has quadratic nonlinearities. So this is, imagine that your operator A here, it's a nice enough that you get energy estimates that are okay. And so this is your equation that has quadratic nonlinear terms. This is BUU. You do some energy estimates and you see that your energy estimates are of this shape. And then you have this control norm here, which is some normal view. And if this normal view is of size epsilon, you apply Grunwald and you get a lifespan which goes to epsilon to minus one. So this is how, for how long your solution is gonna exist. And this is trivial and this is what you do usually for, for problems when you want to do local world closeness. Now, if, if you do have equations that have cubic nonlinearities, let's say I don't have quadratic nonlinearities or if I had them, I got rid of them somehow. And I'm gonna get back to that in a second. If I have only cubic nonlinearities, I do an energy estimates. Now I can see that my control norm here appears squared. So let's imagine it's an infinity for a second. So now this was of size epsilon. I square it, this becomes smaller. So it's size of epsilon squared. So now when I do Grunwald, I do gain. This is epsilon to the minus two. So my solutions are gonna last longer. And you'll be like, okay, how is this related? to lower in your regularity. I agree, let me tell you a little bit of how you do this step. So base, uh, back in the day, the idea was, oh, let's use those normal forms for long time existence. So you go from one over epsilon to one over epsilon lifetime, uh, lifetime of solutions. But I can tell you that this all techniques works in as a whole and helps you for the low regularity. But okay, so how can you usually go from an equation that has quadratic nonlinear terms to an equation that has cubic nonlinear terms? And the answer is no, you cannot really do that in a nutshell. Like depends really 
on the equation. Sometimes you cannot remove quadratic terms. Nevertheless, this works back to the work of uh, Shatach, normal forms, where you can basically take your equation that have quadratic nonlinearities and then transform it into one, if possible, it's a big if, into one that has only cubic nonlinearities. This is the transformation. I don't know if you're familiar with cohole transformation on all sorts of things. So imagine that in itself is a normal form. Now, this is useful for you once you get it to the shape, only if this transformation is bounded. So whatever information I can, let's say now I do energy estimates for this and they work. Then I'm gonna get some un, you know, lifespan of existence of this V to be one over epsilon squared. But if I don't have a bounded transformation, there is no way I can take this information that I have on V to put it on you and say something about you itself. So there are many big ifs. Okay, this really works, this normal form idea, if you are dealing with a semi-linear problem. Things are getting hairy if you don't. And um, so this normal form idea with direct implementation of, oh, I have my equation, I'm going to change in a new equation and a new unknown V that is now a cubic, uh, it has cubic nonlinearities or higher or so on. Uh, that works, but only in certain uh, cases. And requirements, you should have no resident or no structure quadratic interactions. In other words, you should not have three wave resonances. This is some algebraic computation. I'm not going to get into it. If you want, I can explain you uh, after the talk. Uh, it takes this whole thing in itself. It's a whole lecture. And uh, this, uh, so going back and trying to take this method of uh, normal form that Shata had, which worked very well for semilinear problems, to put it in this uh, quasi-linear setting doesn't go. Well, there was some attempt to remedy this with the space-time resonance work of Germain, Masmouli, and Shata still did not. And the, the way to fix this, so do take, you know, take this approach and really go when you can, when you do not have resonances, to go from a quadratic uh, nonlinearity to a cubic one. This actually goes back to the work of um, Al-Azart and Delort, which combines a normal form analysis with uh, a paradifferential symmetrization. So basically, they paradifferential the, take the paradifferential form of the equation. They remove some non-resonant terms in a bounded way, and then some of the um, terms that they cannot remove quadratic ones. They are going to actually manipulate the energy such that they are going to not be seen when you do the energy estimates. In a nutshell, this is the approach. However, this goes back, you know, goes through micro, micro local based type of analysis. So our idea uh, is to modify this, this energy, meaning that I'm not going to change the equations because if I change the equations, I saw what Shatah, you know, the problems that Shatah or other people that tried to use it directly for quasi-linear problem had issues with. So the way to do it is you are not going to apply it to the equation. You don't do anything to your equation, but what you do, you change your, your energy. How do you change it? You are going to add some correction term. In this case, if you have quadratic terms that are non-resonant, the energy in your equation, the energy, this corresponds with cubic changes at the level of your energy. And I, we know we have a whole machinery in place, how you change this energy in a bounded way, such that this energy, when you do the energy estimates, gets this, we call this um, uh, cubic energy estimate. So because it gets solved by... Imagine x uh, dot equals x cubed. So, and so do we, we have a way of doing, and this is based on the normal form. We call it the normal form correction to the energy, but nevertheless, so we don't change the equation. We change the energy and we do it systematically. There are, uh, there is a recipe and you get this energy. Now, what I said so far doesn't look like it has anything to do. It has to do with enhanced line spam. And you'll be like, how is this having to do with, um, how is this related to the, to the whole story. So um, let me let me say a little bit about um, gravity water waves. And the reason I'm saying this for gravity water waves is because this will make things uh, clear. So um, so just for a second, um, I'm not writing equations of the water waves. I'm just saying literally some generic energy estimates and and tell you what happens. So Alazar, Birk, and Julie had this energy estimates for the water waves, just for a moment, think that this is it. So here the control parameter is U in C one half. 
We later on did the sand energy estimates and we got it, we improved it, meaning that our control, so this is at the level of one half above the scaling. We've done this energy estimate and uh, the way we've done it using this modified cubic energy estimate that you see. So we use that modified energy. The way you've done it and it's cubic, the way we've done it, we managed to get the same, almost the same energy estimate, but look at the two control norms. We got this A sigma, so it's U in BMO. We got U in BMO and one derivative of uh, one half derivative of U in BMO. And so this we did better. We went from C one half to BMO with, without doing anything. We did not use any dispersive properties of water waves whatsoever. We just used this modified uh, energy estimate, this cubic energy estimate. And then we did a little bit more. We realized that, look, look at those two. This has zero derivative and this has one half derivative. If we match, if we did some right analysis to actually take one half derivative, one fourth derivative, so half of one half, one fourth to put it on this one, then we will end it up with this kind of control norm. And you gain here in, in a second. Why do you gain? You gain because now you only have to control this guy in L infinity and you gain from Sobolev right away. You don't ask more regularity. So here it's the one fourth that, um, that we got we, in this water waves. And basically, this is what we called uh, uh, cubic energy estimate, balanced cubic energy estimates. So this is one main ingredient. And here I'm saying that we, we use normal forms. It's a whole story how you use normal forms directly and how you use modified energies because those go hand in hand. And this is a very refined analysis. Anyways, there are not regular normal forms because they have variable coefficients. And we can remove normal form, uh, we can remove quadratic terms only if the terms have balanced frequency and you cannot remove them. So then you use the modified energy if you have uh, uh, unbalanced ones. Here, it's a whole story, which I really cannot um, go into because I'm gonna keep you over and I think I'm already past. So to, to explain you a little bit, this refined analysis happens at many levels. You just cannot right away say, oh, I'm gonna get an energy estimates of this sort just because I want to move one fourth derivative on this other term. So to, to do this, you're actually relying a lot on, on this Bonis paradifferential formalism and things get very uh, critical in terms of you, you lose a, a lot of uh, freedom in many ways, but doing the analysis carefully leads you to the right uh, balanced cubic energy estimates. And here was a, was a story about how the equation itself matters. Like when you get energy estimates for your, or on an equation in general, I, I like to first do the energy estimates for the linearization, because when you want to do the energy estimates for your original problem, you are differentiating many times. Yeah, you do it at all levels of regularity. And basically you are looking at a form of a linearized equation. So you look at the linearized equation itself, and then related to this is what we call linear paradifferential equation, which uh, you look at the low frequency guys, uh, those are your coefficients, and this is your unknown, and there is a whole, and then um, you have the paradifferential formulation of your original problem as well. So there is an interplay between the sets of equations that are four, and all of those sets of equations, here I was gonna explain how the normal form analysis goes, but I think I'm, really literally out of time. But what I want to say is that at the end of the day, what I just told you was half of the story, meaning half of the story that I, how we do cubic energy estimates, at least I told you some ideas. So cubic energy, balanced cubic energy estimates. And so to show you how it improved for water waves, and then I'm going to show you for minimal surface, because this is where everything started. So it basically started to look at the difference S, the regularity that was previously done and S critical. So it went down to almost one fourth. And look at here, this was just using balanced cubic energy estimates. If we do use three cards estimates, it's gonna be lowered even down. So this is gonna be probably one of the sharpest low regularity results in water wave. This is water waves. And it's the same ideas, the same quasi-linear uh, modified um, energy estimates, basically the same idea that led to uh, balanced cubic energy estimates in water waves is something that we applied for uh, 
for minimal surface. And let me show you a bit. This is the classical energy estimate that people got for derivative nonlinear wave equations. So you have two derivatives of u bounded in an infinity. Our model, which is a derivative nonlinear wave equation, but the one that in top of being just satisfies this nonlinear null structure, that's already cubic, our problem that I show you. And if we do energy estimates, we get something of this sort. So we have two control norms. This L infinity one, derivative of U in L infinity. This is from the metric actually. And this is two derivatives in L infinity. So what we do in this paper that I'm presenting today, we do a balanced cubic energy estimate. So there is a lot of work that we take one half derivative from here and move it here. So then we balance things. And this is how our control norm is gonna look like. And now this is where we win that one fourth derivative that I was telling you about. And this is the same kind of normal form analysis that you've seen in water waves, though a little bit much harder because um, this normal form structure that I was telling you about in water waves, basically it's much weaker in, um, in this minimal surface. And you need similar estimates, balanced sim energy estimates for the linearized equation. And this further adds to the, uh, the whole picture and it's becoming more and more harder. Now, let me say a little bit. I think this, those next two slides are essential to actually form an opinion. So this is the covariant wave equation that we're working. This is the energy momentum tensor that I wrote here is divergence free. And now how do you usually get energy estimates? You're gonna have a, vector like a vector field which is time like x and you are going to contract it with uh, uh, your uh, energy momentum tensor and then you are going to integrate and you want to get an energy estimate of this sort and now you wonder is this possible can you really do this for this equation and the answer to this is no you cannot really do it like this you have to do it in a para differential uh, way and um, and you need a good choice for this vector field X, this is the problem, which has to be at the level, you know, it has to work for all uh, levels of regularity. You need those energy estimates for a large range of S going from down where we want to go as low as we can, and then up to whatever regularity you would like. So, um, let me explain a little bit. So, if you look back here at this energy estimate that you want, this is the energy flux. The, this is a kind of a commutator looking like thing. If you look at the principal part of a commutator, it's gonna be this Lie bracket, which looks like this. So potential choices, you wonder, okay, I want some X that satisfies some certain properties. What are my potential choices? How can I choose this X? So let me, let me say a little bit, the way you can choose this X naively, you can look at this principal symbol and say, oh, this can be, if you look at this guy, this is approximately like the metric times the derivative of X plus X times the derivative of G. Um, so th this is kind of uh, uh, um, clear from the form uh, from the X here. And uh, th the fact that you need G and X to have the same uh, regularity level. But the problem of thinking that you're a potential choice for X. So let me point out that you know that your metric G depends on the derivative of U. So now if you know this, I made this observation. Now, if you look at this principal symbol for the energy flux, more or less, this is how it looks like. You will think, oh, then I can have this choice. Then I can choose my X to be a function of the derivative of U. But you, as you try it, you'll see this is too narrow and doesn't work then you'll be like, okay, I need to choose it to be the same regularity of, of, uh, of the derivative of u. And this is gonna turn out not working out because it's too broad. So what you're gonna do, and this is a key idea in this paper, the correct answer turns out to be a middle ground. So basically we said that we, can, we need to define a custom design class of, uh, of objects and we call them para product distributions. And this is some idea that we got traction in uh, PDEs with noise, with white noise. 
and this is the work of Heyer and others. So we are not the first to look at this para controlled distribution. So what is this saying? It says, look, X is not quite going to be like the derivative of U. It's going to be like derivative of U, but it's going to have some low frequency terms in here. This is the para differential notation of Bonnie. This T stands for low frequencies on A, where this A is some nonlinear thing that has lower frequencies of X and of the derivative of U. So it's going to be some guy, some derivative of U times some low frequencies, guy lower than the frequencies of this DU, plus some terms R. There are going to be some balanced terms, which I'm going to uh, throw them into the in, into a balanced class, and I'm going to deal with them. So, and then how do we construct this? So X is, is micro locally, like the derivative of U, basically. But one argument, a key argument in this paper is that we can construct this U, this, this X, sorry, we can construct this X so we can control the energy flux CX that I said here. And this is a very involved construction where you argue in, inductively on the dyadic frequency scales. And this is an idea that relates to the wave map renormalization work of Terry and, and Tataro. So this X is basically construct step by step inductively based on, on what you need to kill this, this, this portion, this uh, principal symbol of the energy flux. We call it para-killing vector field because it actually kills only the unbalanced components of the, of, the, of the vector field. It's not killing because it doesn't kill everything, only the uh, unbalanced ones. We call it para-killing. So this is one main ingredient. You need to find that X. And once you have it, uh, then what do you do? You go back and use three cards, and I'm going to wave hands. This was three cards estimates without loss that you know from Tataru and Smith. And then we are going to use with, uh, with losses, and I'm going to be done in a second. We are going to use with losses, and you can ask me, OK, can you really apply? And let me point out this difficulty. So we are, I'm saying, oh, we are going to really, we cannot really apply directly the result of Smith. That's why I put this. The reason you cannot is because of the regularity. They prove this result for the two derivatives of the metric in L2, L infinity, and you don't have that. So here we don't. We have one half derivative of the metric. So we are very low. One half derivative of the metric, you, you, we, we have it in a... Um, L1 and infinity, so you, you don't have that much. So there is a way to, to apply this, and you can ask me how, because the result is for large data. True hours is for large data as well, even though I tricked you that it's for uh, small data. The reason being, you have the finite speed of propagation. In a nutshell, you can use that in your advantage to actually trade off um, um, basically homogeneous versus inhomogeneous of all spaces and then gain. And it's basically a rescaling argument. It's a tricky rescaling argument that allows you to really apply this, this at the end of the day, this, this work of, um, of uh, Tataru and Smith, but carefully. And carefully meaning that you're not gonna apply it for the whole time interval. You're gonna do three cards in, with losses, but you're gonna take advantage of the, um, of this uh, finite speed of propagation. And here I explain to you how you exactly apply this. I'm going to skip this, how you apply this work of, of, um, of uh, Tataru and Smith by taking advantage of the, the fact that you're using a wave equation. And here I'm, I'm listing out, even though it's not, let me finish with this, it's not quite true. It's not quite meaning that those are indeed nonlinear wave equations. And as you can see here, depending on the method that people used, how the regularity, the difference between what was known and the criticality became smaller and smaller and smaller towards very small. Now, what I want to mention here is that one thing that I'm not being honest is that some of the results here are generic, are for quasi-linear wave equations with no other extra bits. Other results here, it's this is Kleidermann Rodiansky, it's energy estimates for a quasi-linear wave equation with a weak null structure uh, property. This one is for has no null structure whatsoever. This one that you see in here has a nonlinear null structure, but under the same umbrella quasi-linear nonlinear wave equation, the uh, best result in terms of the ones that satisfy uh, certain properties is this is how far we got in terms of regularity. It's one four plus epsilon. 
So this is it. And I'm sorry, I kept you 10 minutes over. Thank you so much. Those are some references of the works that got into this, this whole work, which was pretty lengthy. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for the talk. Um, let's see, are there some questions? Uh, Ovidia, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Michael, what is the final goal to uh, for this uh, 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 gap between the S and the critical value? I remember you mentioned at some point that Tatalu Smith, they have one quarter and then uh, Lindenberg showed the example that that's, uh, that's uh, somehow it's the optimal one by constructing some uh, example. And then I think you mentioned that like, but if you add some uh, special condition, then you can actually go down the- uh... Exactly. So yes, some of the generic ones are done that it's closed, like Smith okay. and Tataru. But then you have those versions, like for example, Rodiansky, the, the result of Rodiansky and, and uh, Sergio. They went down, so this is in GR, yeah? They, their result is as low as they, they could have done it, but doesn't mean it's sharp. There is no contraexample for the Einstein's equation, and there is nothing else that says you cannot lower it because they do have some weak node structure okay. there. And maybe some of the techniques here do work to lower it. In our experience, most of those methods that you've seen here are very robust. So the goal is to really see how all of those structure, extra structures that you can have can help you lower the generic result of Smith and Tataru. So you have a, a tool, or not, a box of tools that will help you do that because most of the equations that you're gonna deal with are gonna be geometric and they're gonna have some structure. How do you use that in your advantage? It's like local world poseness nowadays. You can get local world poseness just raising your hand or you can do very, refined local world poseness and lower the regularity. It's exactly the same. We want to lower it for nonlinear wave. And in general, for quasi-linear problems, how much you can expect to be close to the criticality. How, because you, you, we don't have any true result that says, look, this is what you need to do. This is a recipe that gets you this close and further you cannot. Uh, do people have a specific, specific uh, physically interesting example that they believe uh, that for that particular example, it could go down to uh, the critical value? No. Okay. No, there is no such result. So honest quasi-linear. Now I can come up with a fake quasi-linear problem, which we call it weak quasi-linear. Um, and then you get the criticality. But no, in general, it's not true. This is a very open question. It's not true. We, we don't know. Yeah, there is no example, real hard example that says you can lower it to the criticality. Okay, I see. Thank you. Any other questions? So I, I just have a very quick question. So your result does apply just for time-like minimal surfaces or for this more general uh, non equations that satisfy the no condition? For more general, we, sh we, more we chose general, this so example. example. Yeah, we chose, yeah, we chose this example just because it satisfied that nonlinear null structure. It was the only geometrical and basically well known model that people were interested in seeing. Can you go further? But there are many other models, like Young Mills type I, of equation. Yeah. If I look at a nonlinear wave equation, no, not quasi linear, just nonlinear wave yes. equation. Is there like some special structure that I oh, can... for nonlinear? You just hit it with one more derivative and it becomes quasi linear. And you I know, but let's say if I just don't want to do that, if I just want to look at that particular equation, is there like some special structure that I can ask in that particular case to get better regularity than the nonlinear structure, the, the nonlinear uh, null condition? or weak null condition, if you have one of those conditions satisfied, then you would hope to lower the regularity. Okay, I, I thought the null condition was referred more for the derivative, right? I mean- But you will have some sorts of- Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So let's see, are there other questions? Okay, uh, so thank you very much for the talk, Mihaela. And thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. 
Bye and to everybody. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah, sorry yeah, I kept you guys. Again. Yeah, thanks very much for the nice talk. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Bye. guys. Thank you. For Thank you. Bye. -bye. I hope to see you in person someday. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Okay.